The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Today's message, are you ready, is becoming a Zadok people. Now, if you don't know what that is, we'll explain it. But uh, in uh, Ezekiel 44, this is kind of tying in with Jennifer's series on Ezekiel. This is my little part. And then she'll go back to finishing up and correcting any of my errors because she's an expert on dates and times. And I go a long time ago. (laughs) <laughs> this happened? Okay. Um, so, But here, here's what I want you to f- see that really stood out to me. Things that I'd never heard before. All of you have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, haven't you? And for the most part, uh, that's a recent discovery, relatively speaking. And only within the last 20 years, they released above and beyond things that they found. And for me, it is exciting, you know, because uh, in a day and age where, where uh, uh, prophecy uh, is so significant, the beautiful part about it is, is there was prophecies given before Jesus by a certain sect that was 100% accurate. Isn't that beautiful? And how, how can I say 100% accurate? Because this was before Jesus and it was prophesied of the things that would take place that Jesus fulfilled. Now, uh, these prophecies uh, that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, in the caves of Qumran in the Judean wilderness, they are written by the Essenes. For me, I never paid much attention to that sect, but I'm fascinated by some of the things they did. But these uh, Essenes were a Jewish sect that formed around the Zadok priesthood during what we know biblically as the 400 silent years. You all heard between Malachi and Matthew, the 400 silent years. We didn't think much happened. Oh, I want to tell you something. People didn't, people served God just because it was called historically the silent years didn't mean that people weren't passionately pursuing God, at least some of them. And it says the 400 silent years between the Old and the New Testament the Zadok priesthood began after the co-high priest, Abiathar, was unfaithful to David and his son, Solomon. 1 Kings 1, and of course I'm coming from, and we're going to zero in today on Ezekiel 44. You can read the whole chapter, but I'm only going to take a portion of Ezekiel 44 for the entire message. I feel it's that important. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> but... It says in Ezekiel 44, 15, But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me and minister to me. Uh, in ancient times, and uh, this is some of this is new information for me from a historical point of view, but it says in ancient times, the Essenes, Pharisees, Sadducees, Zealots, these are like sects within uh, the the Jewish population. Uh, They were contemporaries of Jesus. Now the Essenes lived purely, simply, and devoutly. But some lived in villages and towns while others moved to the caves around the Dead Sea. Where the Dead Sea Scrolls, get it? Okay, (laughs) but listen to this. This is before Jesus. That particular sect, and think of it, 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 for me, it just opens up the scriptures because remember the Pharisees and the Sadducees were not popular with Jesus, were they? Okay? They had uh, pretty much indoctrinated their people in the Jewish way according to them. And obviously, it was in opposition to what Jesus wanted. But there were people who did this. Listen to this. This is just some of the prophetic words that were prior to Jesus. They prophesied. And, uh, 
that the Messiah is the Son of God. Now, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Messiah was going to be a military leader that was going to take over. So there were people who prophesied. There was all, God's always had a people, the silent years or no silent years, there was something going on significantly. As a matter of fact, when you think about it, John the Baptist did not look like a Sadducee or Pharisee. He was doing stuff that they would say, oh, it's one of those. They could have easily said, oh, one of those Essenes, you know, one of that sect, you know, that's the spooky sect. They believe in spiritual stuff. Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. The Pharisees believed more in what certain rabbis said over the years by tradition and by word of mouth than they did the Old Testament. Okay, so now you've got, listen to these prophecies though. I get chills just read. I might read them twice if you get excited enough here. But this is, and these were found in Qumran. And only within the last 20 years have they been released. So scholars, sometimes they go over stuff, over stuff, over stuff, and then release it. But then by the time the general public would have it, it's been years. Now, Messiah is the Son of God. Whoa, that would put a monkey wrench into the Pharisees and Sadducees. Messiah is God incarnate. Whoa. God became man. Messiah is from the tribe of Judah. Okay. Messiah is virgin born. Oh, those people that believe that kind of stuff. I could just see, I could see the average Jewish person who've been trained under Pharisees and Sadducees. Yeah, then there's those people. All right. They believe uh, the Messiah is virgin born. We worship the Messiah. Mm, he might be a great general leader, but I'm not going to worship him. Uh, Messiah is an everlasting king. Messiah dies for us. Wow. There's a physical resurrection. Don't you like to see 100% prophecies? These things were spoken before it happened, right? <laughs> I, I, if I get any dates in here, Jennifer will go. So I'm not going to give any dates. Which one? one. Which one? Oh, yeah, I'm getting to that one. There is one date in here that's really important. Messiah brings salvation. The Levites, or the leaders, crucify the Messiah. Messiah resurrects. Messiah ascends. Messiah creates a new priesthood. Messiah's priesthood is eternal, if you read Hebrews, according to the order of Melchizedek. An eternal priesthood. And the veil of the temple was rent. And the one Jennifer says, make sure you include, is that the Messiah would die in 32 AD. I think these people were God chasers, myself. I think these people, but you realize how silly they must have sounded. Because, you know, the religious leaders at that time thought John the Baptist was a goofball and Zacharias and Anna. These are people who were hungering after God. And like I said, these uh, scenes, uh, it was kind of like a follow-up to the Zadok priesthood. And they were, they lived simply, purely, honestly before the Lord. And so 32 AD, can you imagine that? Pinpointing it to that level of accuracy. Uh, so I just found that I think there's going to be even more stuff. These Essenes were also um, keepers of the temple library. And at the time of some of them went to the caves, some stayed there. And it makes sense now when you look at the scriptures, how 3,000 get saved at one time. If they had any Essene background where they've heard these things, they go, wow, this, this Jesus is fulfilling those things that we heard whether we believe them or not. And the veil, as a matter of fact, Matthew, 
I think it was Matthew, Matthew or John, Matthew. Matthew even said, and the veil in the temple was rent. Now, he didn't elaborate on that, but the people that had this foreknowledge knew that that was a sign that would happen. When Messiah died, the temple, the veil in the temple would be rent. They heard this stuff before. That, to me, that makes it all the more interesting because when, when he said that, that was like, well, I just knew uh, theoretically the veil was rent. Jesus said, you're not going to confine me in here. I'm coming out. <laughs> you know, but it was so, to me, it's so much richer than that. Don't you think? Uh, now, I don't know uh, a lot of detail about these. Jennifer will probably cover some of the history of the uh, Zadok priesthood. But all I know is what the Lord spoke to me very clearly. He's saying people get off track so easy, even with good things, even with religious things. You can be evangelistically off track to where you're no longer seeking God. You're busy doing works. I mean, as good as that is. So we have to be careful to stay focused. And I want to cover that. But I believe what God is speaking, and this is the title of the message, Becoming a Zadok People. How do we become a Zadok people? How do we become those that minister to the Lord, that don't go astray when other people may go astray? And astray can be, uh, I think Stina had that word that I really appreciate. She says, as a people of God, we're supposed to be on true north. It doesn't take much to go off course. You can just go off a little course on some kind of busy work that looks religious and there's a warning in Revelations that says you've lost your first love. It's not hard to be busy and lose your first love. So I just find that this is fascinating. Now you realize all of these prophetic words may have been given, and if they were, if you were trained pretty much under the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you would have just dismissed this as crazy stuff, or oh, you know those the scenes, how they are. <laughs> But to see 100% of their prophetic words, I can't wait for more stuff to come out of the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. It's going to be fascinating in the days ahead, and for such a time as this. Uh, what year was it where they actually discovered the first time? 19, 1946-47. That's relatively recent. But only in the last 20 years have other things been released that they found. Yeah, before this, yeah, they only released fragments of scripture. I know that when they when it first came out, I remember reading about how they found fragments of Isaiah and how valid it was. But remember, some of these went there to the caves to live simply, and because they were uh, the ones who were considered scribes, scribes were the keepers of the temple library, they took copies with them. And that's what you find uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Is that fascinating or what? But for such a time as this, I think God is unveiling his heart and saying, there's always been a people. There's always been a people and there's always been a remnant. And I'm calling forth for a remnant in the church, a people to become like the, uh, the Zadok priesthood who didn't go astray. And it is easy. Because right now, uh, the, the world ha ha culture has influenced the church to such a degree. I even read an article where um, they were looking for Christian leaders because if they could indoctrinate them properly, then the, the whole church would get the same material. All right? So, you know, that's called an agenda. That's not nice. <laughs> an agenda is actually idolatry, too. All right, so... Here we go. The Zadok priesthood. God's raising up, I believe, both fivefold ministers to, to help instruct, but I believe he wants a Zadok people. A Zadok people is actually, in Jennifer, we're getting this in Ezekiel, the last stage is the ones that dwell in the house. A people who are called to live in God's house uh, have to become a Zadok people. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, there's seven elements that I'm going to cover but become that type of people, sons and daughters, how to be and how to do like the Zadok priesthood, which got so honored because of their devotion to God. Now, I'm going to start with, um, I'm going to give you Ezekiel. You want to write this down if you're a note taker. Ezekiel 44, verses 23 and 24. Ezekiel 44, 
Then we're going to cover, eventually here, we'll get to it, Ezekiel 44, 15 to 28. And that's pretty much going to be the entire message. But I just feel it's really incumbent upon us to stay focused and not get off track. God is talking about intimacy with Him, seeking Him first, first love, and we need to just plant our feet in a prophetic stance and say, I'm not budging. I'm not changing this, the message because I've said it before. <laughs> you know, a lot of times we want variety when what we need is specificity. All right. Ezekiel 44, verse 23 and 24. These Zadok priests, they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the unholy and cause them to discern, cause them to discern, to distinguish, to differentiate. That's what discern means. It means to open their eyes to see there's stuff they don't know, and they're not making a distinction. They're just lumping it all together. And it says, they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the unholy, and will cause them to discern between the clean and the unclean. And in controversy, they will stand in judgment. I know some people have a hard time with uh, even the concept of leadership, whether it's in business or the church or what have you. But I'll tell you what, God's placed people in there that you should be bouncing stuff off of instead of bouncing it off your unsaved friends or, or neighbors. <laughs> because you're going to get the opinions of a culture. So here's the seven areas, and we're going to cover these. <coughs> Number one, well, let, let, let me read the other scripture first. I gave you Ezekiel 44, 23 and 24. Now I'm going to give you Ezekiel 44, 15 to 28. Now I'll read that. But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel, what they do? Went astray. They went astray from me. They shall come near to me to minister to me, and they will stand before me to offer the fat and the blood, says the Lord. They shall enter my sanctuary, and they shall come near my table to minister to me, and they shall keep my charge. They shall not, they shall have, I like this part, they shall have linen turbans on their heads and linen trousers on their bodies. They shall not clothe themselves with anything that causes sweat. If you are in ministry and you are sweating, you're probably into dead works because you're supposed to be led by the Spirit and it's supposed to be the Spirit of God working through you, being yoked together with the Lord. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. If it's heavy, you're probably trying too hard with will worship. <clears throat> now it says, they shall not wear anything that causes sweat, and they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the unholy, and cause them to discern between the clean and the unclean, and in controversy, and by the way, when there's controversy, this is who you should be going to, they shall stand as judges and judge it according to my judgments. They shall keep my laws and my statutes in my appointed meetings, and they shall hallow the Sabbath. It shall be in regard to their inheritance I am their inheritance. When your satisfaction is in Him and not stuff, not ministry, not titles, Him. Your sufficiency is there. That's your inheritance. You're all I want. You're ever, all I ever needed. You remember that uh, chorus from a song? You're all I want. You're all I ever needed. That is meant to be a reality, not a clever slogan. Let me give you the seven areas that I think are significant. Minister to the Lord, number one. To restore, number two, restore glory and cleansing of sin. Three, exercise spiritual authority. Number four, teach discernment. And when you judge, you judge righteous judgment. Number five, judge righteous judgment. Now, if you're walking in discernment, you can judge righteous judgment because you're not judging according to the 
hearing of the ear or the seeing of the eye. You're judging righteous judgment. You're going by the Spirit. <clears throat> Judge righteous judgment is number five. Number six is find satisfaction in God's presence. Remember that word God gave us, Jennifer, when we travel? He just told us it was very unpredictable traveling because if you don't speak at a church, you don't have an income. <laughs> and you have expenses in the process. We did that for 12 years. But he said, fill up. This is what we would do in the morning. Fill up, and I'll fill up your schedule. Fulfill what I tell you to do. Fulfill, and you will be fulfilled. And, and there was like an understanding that Real satisfaction is in him. It's not in what you do. And six was finding the satisfaction in God's presence. Actually, the seventh one is one that God gave me to reevaluate what he was doing in me over the years from a baby Christian uh, till now. He said, in that intimacy, in that ministering to me, in that spirit-to-spirit -spirit touch, here's what I was doing with you, Dennis. First of all, when you would close your eyes and meet me, you would touch my presence. I started with a touch. The touch means we're meeting. It's an altar. It's where I meet God, and God meets me, and we touch. He says, stay there long enough and you get the embrace. And the embrace is like abide. You want to stay there. But it's his glue that's keeping you there. Satisfaction. First thing I found out is that, you know, you stay in that embrace long enough and it satisfies. And then that satisfaction worked in me. I was going, Oh, God, this is so good. I got to do it back. I got to do it back. And you know, when you really feel the love of God, you want to pour it out. Or it's not real. It's not just satisfied that I feel good. It's that satisfaction makes me want to reciprocate. And so I would reciprocate. And God said, that's abounding love in the scriptures. That's overflowing love. You, you can't give something you don't have. So you can't love God unless it's the love of God that you found satisfaction in. That is is worship all right and so he says uh, that satisfaction will be personal but then you will give it away and that's abounding love abounding love starts to reveal the heart of the father all of a sudden that giving love motive god reveals to you that's that's the heart of heart and likeness of the father that's the way the father is and his heart wants to lead many sons to glory, to be an expression of the Father. Remember, Philip said, Jesus said to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The highest form of communication is expression. And so it's not how much Bible you know or how much you've understood. It's when someone says, I want what you have. There needs to be an expression of it or it's not real. You can act like a Christian, you can play church, but the real you is going to be expressed in the public when no one's looking. How do you behave in the dark, so to speak? How are you in the world? Do people say, I see a change in you for the better? Until then, the word hasn't been really working in you like it should. All right. <clears throat> now, in my first pastorate, I had anorexic people. I had drug addicts. I had people coming off of alcohol. I had a lot of situations. And you know where I saw a lot of them? That applied themselves. We can't make it happen to you. But I taught them one phrase, and they practice it. Focus. You give power to what you give attention to. You start giving attention to Jesus and that other stuff diminishes. You just give attention to your always and your problems and you will increase them. You fortify them. It's one thing to say you have an issue, then take it before God and we should never hear it again. 
it should be resolved. I always give the illustration where Jennifer didn't resolve it. She kept saying, I prayed through. I released my daughter, Allison, to the Lord. Well, then why you keep taking it back if you released? That's not the way God worked. I said, tell me exactly how you're praying this through, because you know how to do this stuff. She went, I release Allison to the Lord as long as she don't get pregnant. I go, no, 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 that's not release. That's conditions. You still got strings attached. You're not in control. They're God's servants, not yours. They belong to him and not to you. You are a steward, not an owner. And then it worked. But focus, it cleanses you. If you stay focused on ministering to the Lord, like the Zadok priesthood, it, 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 you walk in the light as he is to let you start having fellowship with God and with one another. That's the test. You can't say, I have this great relationship with God. It's these people that are always giving me a hard time. All right? <clears throat> it cleanses you. It protects you. The peace of God will guard your heart and your mind. It motivates you. And when it motivates you, that focus of focusing in on him, that motivation is the love of God because God's not motivated by anything else other than the love of God. You want the proper motive? <laughs> focus on him. He's your exceedingly great reward. That's what he told these sons of Zadok. You don't need land and materialism. He says, I will be your satisfaction. I will be, like you said to Abraham, your exceedingly great reward. You may have had other stuff, but I am your exceedingly great reward. So it liberates, sets you free. It heals you on the inside. And we know a lot of people need healing on the inside. It's warfare. What is warfare in the purest sense in the spirit realm? It's not shouting and yelling. Warfare in the purest sense is displacement. It's when the kingdom of God advances and takes place where the enemy had a, a stronghold. <clears throat> All right. You give power to what you give attention to. If you can't remember none of this stuff, that's okay. Just write down, you give power to what you give attention to, and that's all you really need in the day-to-day -day life. Really. You look at what you're going on and on about and say, you know what, you're giving power to that, and that's demonic. How come you're tolerating that? Why haven't you dealt with that more quickly? Why haven't you brought that thought captive to the obedience of Christ rather than telling everybody else? Because it's got you, not God. Now, if it gets your goat, it's your goat. I just, I just love looking at those seven areas because it's ministering to the Lord himself. The fat and the blood. This is what the sons of Zadok, they offered the fat and the blood. And uh, my priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, who keep charge of my sanctuary, when the children of Israel went astray, when everybody else got off center, I had this remnant that stayed focused. So we're not going to change the subject on Tuesday night. We're going to stay focused, right? We're seeking first love, and we want to be that remnant. God's looking for a people that will be like Zadok. Come near to me to minister to me, and they shall stand before me and offer the fat and the blood. The blood is for your sin. When you, you're going to stand before God, you ask God for forgiveness for your sin. The fat is your anointed worship. That after the sin, did you ever notice that after you forgive somebody, you feel peace, love? That's the nature of God. God, he himself is our peace. You've got Jesus now there. Now worship from there, and you're offering up the reality of your relationship. That's true worship. You're worshiping in spirit and reality. Spirit and truth is spirit and reality. And a lot of people worship who knows what, but... All have sinned and fall short of the glory. So uh, the blood is for sin. The fat is for the glory of the kingdom to come. Uh, it's anointed worship. And it requires, oh, we got to skip this part, obedience. No, no, we can't skip that. We'll have to include obedience. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're saved from sin by the blood. Sin, we start dealing with sin. But we are restored to the glory of the kingdom, to the goodness of God, to the nature of God, to the kingdom of God, when 
when you walk in obe obedience. Here's another little one-liner that I saw people come off drugs, come off of everything. Once they, you give power to what you give attention to, the other one to encourage them. Because when, when you're changing or you're in the process of change, the, the devil usually attacks with, this is taking too long, it's not working. That's one of the best tools in the tool belt. This is taking too long, you're not working, you're not making progress. When, here's the other statement, write this down. Baby steps of obedience. Baby steps. Baby steps. Baby steps of obedience builds spiritual muscle, builds spiritual authority. And it, baby steps of obedience makes it easier the next time. Now, maybe you're not perfect yet. Maybe you're not walking in the kind of victory that you know you should have. But I'll tell you what, if you're still applying obedience, repentance for the sin, and baby steps of obedience, you're offering up pure worship to God. You're honoring God. Even in your disheveled condition, you are still honoring God. We get restored through that anointed worship. The next, the next thing on, on God's agenda is really... Uh, dealing with the fact that there's there's two problems with the fallen nature, with that flesh, and sin and rebellion. <laughs> sin, you've got forgiveness. He provided that for you. I mean, you, you can't beat it. But rebellion, the solution is obedience. Now, what are the two statements that if you wrote that down and you were in a hard place and you walked it out, you would see improvement. And that first one is you give power to what you give attention to. You better fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher. On Jesus Christ within, the hope of glory. You stay focused on that, and then baby steps of obedience will get you on the other side. And when we, when we traveled, we saw people getting powerful emotional healing, going church to church. Of course, when you're Joe Heavy speaker, you listen better. Uh, when, you're, when it's your pastor, it's, oh, well, yeah. We've heard this before. I already, I already know that. But when we travel, we saw the transformation take place when people saw that they were giving power to what they give attention to and they shifted to Jesus. Then baby steps of obedience, they started seeing new strength. New strength. Spiritual authority. Spiritual muscle. Baby steps of obedience instead of rebellion. And here's the thing uh, that we saw, uh, the ones that didn't seem like they ever made progress, no matter how much they heard, no matter how much they were taught, we found they had one thing in common, their lack of effort to apply themselves. They wanted Joe Heavy Speaker to just lay hands on them and they're done. I'd like to have somebody lay hands on be instant maturity, walking in ascension life. It just doesn't work that way. Remember the garment that we talked about, uh, uh, the, the, the wedding garment, that it was embroidered? Yeah, it was white underneath, but it was embroidered. Embroidered means those every tiny little baby stitch of obedience embroidered in other parts. So guess what? It's a process. So don't quit. Baby steps of obedience builds authority. Now, uh, we're... We're rebels at heart, let's face it. I always said the mind, the will, and the emotions are like three bad kids. It doesn't matter which one starts off. The other two will follow. Go, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, let's go do that. Right? It could be a thought. It could be an emotion. And it could be a determination of the will. But the other two go, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the work of the cross really has to deal with all three. If you don't deal with all three, you don't have lordship taking over. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, God made us alive that we were dead in our sins. We once walked according to the ways of the world, uh, according to the prince of the power of the air. Isn't that interesting? We had the devil running our life, and we thought, I was just doing my thing. I'm just smoking pot and doing my own thing. And the prince of the power of the air was running my life, but I thought I was free. <laughs> and that spirit now works in the sons of disobedience. Oh, so that spirit could work in us if we're disobedient. To know to do and not to do. 
sin. Ah. So obedience, obedience, so baby steps of obedience brings an end to our rebellion. We should have a flag saying, I obeyed, end of rebellion. I am a white flag, surrender. I surrender to Jesus. <laughs> it's better to surrender than to fight because you know the, the definition of meekness? Jesus says, take upon my yoke and learn from me for I am meek and lowly heart. You know what meek was? I'm not going to dispute or resist. How many Christians you know, the first thing out of their mouth if there's correction is to dispute it. Meekness is don't dispute or resist. What did Jesus do? Didn't he learn obedience by the things that he suffered? So you shouldn't have to? <laughs> I think you're going to learn the same way. It's going to be the cross. Now, you know, the failure in meekness is the sin of disobedience. That's not doing, but it's also the sin of presumption, doing something he didn't tell you to do. <laughs> and I used to, I remember our basics books we once had, we had a guy standing on the steeple of a very tall church going, some people would rather do the wrong thing than nothing. They're so afraid of nothing. If God's not telling you to do something, the real test is for you to be able to sit still in his presence and enjoy him, to be and to do all that he called you to be and all that he called you to do. Being, though, is more important than doing, isn't it? What you are, it's not what you do. Very essence. All right. Are you getting beat up enough today? But though he was a son, he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Good. How do we avoid that? We don't. We learn the same way. Every suffering that Jesus did ripened into fruit. Ah, the fruit of obedience. He didn't fret or complain. And by the obedience of one man, we receive grace. Now, here's where we're going from there. God has ordained the church to be on the front line, but it always has been a portion. It's sad. The good news is others can follow in later, perhaps. Gideon was only 300 to win the victory over the world of flesh and the devil there with the Midianites. But the rest of Israel got to join in, but somebody's got to take the lead. And I don't know if the ones that got to follow in later were what their condition was. I like to believe that they made a way where there wasn't a way. But I believe God's called us to full stature ministry. The whole name of the ministry is maturity. And that maturity will involve a remnant. Look at those Essenes, how they were made fun of by the general population who were trained under the Pharisees and the Sadducees. <laughs> All those crazy Essene people there. They believe the Messiah is going to be human and God at the same time. And he's going to die, and then he's going to resurrect. Can you imagine what that would sound like to heady people who believe that the Messiah is going to be a general and he's going to come in and win battles for us? That brings us to the next place. If obedience builds spiritual authority, it's going to be the authority that comes from the church that's going to impact the world. Right now, I don't think the church in general is impacting the world very much. And you can be busy doing stuff even, but it's not necessarily... I'm believing that this remnant is going to bring... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's almost like it's going to be like in the upper room in Pentecost. They pursued and they obeyed God to wait. And most of them couldn't wait. Started out with 500 and ended up with 120. <laughs> so what did that tell you? Uh, I, got, I got things to do. I got places to go. I got people to see, you know. Um, but the ones that maintained it and 
the beauty of how many people got saved when they heard the preaching of Peter on that day of Pentecost. They heard stuff that they had heard before, but it's come to pass. This is that. That's the excitement. Wow. And, and let's, uh, you know, these Pharisees and the Sadducees, let's make it really clear. Jesus was quite clear about his opinion of them, wasn't he? You snakes, you brood of vipers. When Israel went astray, they were the sons of Zadok. And that remnant type passed all the way through to the prophecies that they had, you know, those wacky, charismatic, Pentecostal type people, that they had in advance. And when you think about it, look at John the Baptist. Could you imagine what the Pharisees and Sadducees looked at him and said, and then we have those people, <laughs> locust and honey. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there was wacky ones. There had to have been. <laughs> but it came to pass. Famous words. When uh, you get to the place where rebellion ceases, you realize you're blocking the kingdom and your and your rebellion. Really, you're blocking the plans and the purposes of God to go through you. Now, in the inner court, they had the table of showbread, the lampstand, the altar of incense. And I, could, I just always saw that as the mind, will, and emotions, among other things. The incense was like the anointed emotions of the presence of God flowing through your emotions, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. The lampstand was a revelation, the light that comes. Jesus himself is the light that came into the world. Finish that scripture, though. What did it say? People love darkness. <laughs> There's always a portion, but that light in the inner court is illumination. And the bread, that's the will, the flour that was ground, submissive. And the, they were offering it up to the Lord. Now, <clears throat> Jesus himself said, I am the bread of life. Uh, but listen to this. Here's the part that I found significant. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 to 23. There's a term in there that most people overlook. This is King James Version. Wherefore, if you be dead in Christ from the rudiments of the world, from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not. Of course, we have that even in the modern day church. Which are all to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. You know, the Pharisees weren't teaching the Old Testament. They were teaching what others, rabbis, had said and the opinions, and then repeat those opinions, whoever had the strongest opinion, I guess. Um, but in here it says, which things indeed, they have a show of wisdom. They're, they really look like something, uh, these doctrines of men. Indeed, they have a show of wisdom. In will worship. Write that word down. Will worship. There's your dead works. And they could be fasting and praying before people. And it's all, all that neglect of the body. Not feeding the flesh. But that's false humility. Will worship. And what I found interesting when I did a word study on this some time ago, that that will worship is actually more inspired by demons than just flesh. They're telling you, pay more attention to this. Will worship. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. And someday do a word study. Look up that rudiments of the world. Remember, he's the prince of the power of the air. So don't you think demons can influence certain practices? Well, that's, that's what it's saying here. Will worship. That's more than just dead works. It's the inspiration of the dead works. So you can 
think you're doing something good, but if it's not in God, it's dead. And what has to be slain here. Now, I believe there was Pharisees and Sadducees that maybe came to Jesus. I know there was a whole lot that got really excited when they saw stuff being fulfilled. But the thing that would have to be slain would be pride. Or there's no hope for Pharisees or Sadducees, but yet some believe. So somewhere they had to humble themselves and say, perhaps I was wrong. I told you all the story of the time that mental health uh, sent me a guy who believed he was Elijah. And I'm going, I'm a young Christian, but I had a reputation for everybody go to Dennis's house and get squared away. And, and he came and he's, it was a Christian friend of mine who worked at mental health. And he says, see if you can do something with this guy. He thinks he's Elijah. God talks to him when there's thunder. That's the only time he talks to him, only with thunder. So you don't get to hear anything unless there's thunder. And, and I'm going, oh, Jesus. Jesus. This is under the breath. Oh, Jesus, help me. What do I do? I don't know what to do. Why did they send me him? I don't know what I'm doing. And, I don't... and then it just dropped in. And I started saying, you know, all those people in the Bible, the famous people in the Bible, the people that love God, including Elijah, they all made mistakes at one time or another. Are you capable of making a mistake? Well, you don't like that one. But he waited, and he goes, maybe, all right, yeah, yeah. I said, you could be wrong then you, you, about being Elijah. But he humbled himself, and he says, I could be wrong. They went back to mental health, and all I heard from the report was he was making rapid progress. Just by admitting he was wrong. But that was more of a word of knowledge, because I didn't know what to do with him. Do you believe you could be wrong? No, if you think everybody else is wrong and you're not, you're not going to make any progress. But that humility is what did it for him. Pride is darkness. Pride is death. Pride is disorder. The way it used to show up when I was a young pastor and I'm learning about Christians, <laughs> and the first thing that I learned was the one that went, I got that first, I got that same revelation first, or... I already knew that, were usually the ones that didn't know much. They, and what they did know maybe was head knowledge, but the pride. The pride was being exhibited. And then one time I actually saw a spirit of pride with my eyes wide open. And to this day, it's as clear as ever it could be. It did just what the scripture said, had a condescending look and a haughty look. And the man tilted his head back. And what that might be good for other people. But I'm complicated. I said, well, I got him crying at least, though. I got, <laughs> I said, complicated? I said, eh. Satan is rooted in sin. God is rooted in love. It's simple. I don't see anybody complicated. Sin is sin. You know, so to uncomplicate yourself, you repent. Yeah, he cried, but I don't know if he ever really repented. Spiritual pride says, "Look what happened. Look, look what I can do." You know, and spiritual pride is a killer. But pride goes before destruction. Haughty spirit before fall. Pride. Here, listen to this. Pride wants to make an excuse because pride refuses to separate itself from that sin. It wants to keep it. Pride wants to keep its sin, so it has to find a way to justify it and make it okay. That's why we always said God can't heal an excuse. You know, once I get on this subject, I'm picturing all these situations flashing before my mind of 45 years of pastoring and, and seeing all the excuses, all the ones that made progress, radical progress, and all the ones that, uh, that's not for me. That's good for other people. I already knew that was usually the telltale sign. You're probably not going to make much progress. 
because even if they knew it, there's an, there's an attitude that, that's not going to submit very well. And spiritual pride, it's a killer. It lusts after knowledge. Pride lusts after knowledge. You'll see them in classes. You'll see them learning and learning. But knowledge puffs up, love builds up. If that knowledge isn't leading them to a deeper love relationship with God, that knowledge isn't doing them any good. I used to have, uh, in my first pastor, I can still remember how God taught me about, about prophecy. And there was a, a person give a prophetic word, nice anointing on it. Someone gave a message in tongues and a prophetic word and interpreted it. And the guy who never prophesied in his life was the expert on that. And he says, he thought he had something. I know that's all false. You know how I know? I said, how do you know? It always happens when there's a quiet period between the worship and the message. He thought because he knew when it was going to happen, that it had to be false. I, I think the Holy Spirit doesn't interrupt me and prophesy in the middle of a sermon, right? Could. <laughs> but they, they come up with their own excuses. Spiritual pride. Eve lusted for knowledge of good and evil. Her lust for knowledge was her downfall. Drug addicts. They have a lust for more drugs. Soon they need something stronger. It doesn't satisfy. The senses become dull. But you get preoccupied. Talk about focus. You get preoccupied with feeding that need. There's three pride attitudes. I'm giving you enough so that if I don't preach for two more weeks, <laughs> I'm sure you're going to have plenty to think about. There's the pride of superiority. Everybody knows that, right? Like the, the guy at the Harvard commencement. Um, enough about me. What do you think about me? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I would, I would probably label that the possibility of the pride of superiority. <laughs> well, narcissism mixed in there. But... The second kind is the pride of sophistication. And pastors have to watch out for Jezebels like that. The pride of sophistication <clears throat> is they select associations to where if they rub shoulders with them, get their picture taken with the president or something, by association, I'm more important. <clears throat> and there's people that do that. They'll rub shoulders with certain people. I remember a lady came to my church. I want you to know, I'm from Rod Parsley's church. <laughs> Does Rob Parsley know you? Were you on staff? Were you in leadership? No. But I just want you to know where I'm coming from. Oh, I'm so impressed. Did you learn anything there? That would be what would impress me. What kind of a Christian walk do you have? How are you when you're not in the church building? The third one, of course, is the pride of inferiority. Once had a keyboard player that it reminded me of this teaching. It was a keyboard player who would perspire profusely praying the keyboard. He couldn't flow in worship. Performance was his God. And precision was his God. He couldn't enjoy it. You know, for most people, if you made a mistake, nobody would know anyway. But he was so locked into his own performance that he would perspire. But the trouble is, that blocked any kind of flow. He, he was borderline useless, though he was quite precise. 
We don't want to be like that. So we understand then that the Zadok priesthood, what were they going to do? They're going to teach my people. They're going to teach my people. So there has to be, in some regard, um, you don't have to believe everything a preacher says. And you don't have to stay in any one church if God's telling you to move. But you better have some respect for, that there is such a thing as leadership in this world. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's in the Bible. You know, if you can't respect your bosses, you can't respect the pastors, <clears throat> there's a certain amount of spiritual authority you'll never have. And like my favorite one <laughs> right now is, I don't need a church. I am the church. John Kelly sent a list of 93, 90 things that he doesn't believe in. Uh, I agreed with all 90. I don't believe in this, this, this. Uh, but one of them was, you know, the word for church is ecclesia. The true definition of that word is congregation. I don't need it to go to church. I am a congregation. I am an assembly. Well, then we better cast those demons out of you. you got multiple personalities in there. Or if we can't cast those demons out, we'll get them all to tithe. So, spiritual authority and positional authority, it's a matter of the heart. It's got to be God, not just good. Like I said, the pride of sophistication, some people can fake it just to get close. Um, he also said to understand the difference between if you're going to minister to the Lord, and that's your primary thing, you're going to have to understand there is authority in this world whether you like it or not. You know, act accordingly. The Bible's real clear on that. Bosses at work, and it tells the bosses how to behave as well. Um, but... The difference between the holy and the unholy, that's what's necessary in the church right now because it's been so impacted. So, uh, teach people to discern between the clean and the unclean. I noticed in the Didache, uh, the first century church, what they taught uh, Gentiles who were clueless, they didn't have any Old Testament, they didn't have any biblical background, they taught them how to behave. This is good, this is bad. You don't kill babies because, just because they're a girl. Where their culture, they're going, really? You had to say, this is right and this is wrong. We gotta raise up a people that are not so influenced by the world and, and uh, the news media that you, you can think biblically. That's your culture. Teach my people to discern between the holy and the unholy. Cause them to discern between clean and unclean. All right. The next area is, uh, I want to just go back to those original seven. If we're ministering the fat and the blood, then the next thing we need to do is restore the glory and the cleansing. The third thing is exercise spiritual authority without sweat. The fourth thing is teach discernment between the holy and the unholy. Judge. Judge righteously. Find satisfaction in God's presence and then minister that satisfaction out. Whoa, give it away. And you'll get more. And then learn the value of touch and how to make that touch, that embrace, bigger and better. And I went way over time, and that's good. Because I had fun. <laughs> Jennifer's been preaching an awful lot lately, <laughs> right? So amen, amen. <laughs> You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. 
For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.